Hello, 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 people. Welcome back to the MUFC MPB YouTube channel. It's another week and another brilliant episode. I think that's quite confident of me to say before we've even got started. But when you're joined by someone like Peter Hall, as we all know, his second appearance on MUFC MPB, we know we're going to be in for some good information. Pete, thank you so much for joining me again. How has things been since the last time we caught up? <laughs> um well, on the pitch, it's remained the same. <laughs> uh, one week, you think United are on the way back and then they go and concede in the 101st minute or whatever it is and, at, at Brentford and the, and and even later at Stamford Bridge and, and still manage to mess things up. Uh, never, never a dull moment, of course. Off the pitch, things have proven a lot more difficult, uh, as we'll get into, um, for Ineos, but at least things are starting to move now and... Uh, can supporters can at least start to think about a brighter future, perhaps? Yeah, exactly that, and I think that's the only thing really as main art fans we've wanted, isn't it? A bit of a a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel. But as you've just touched on there, you know it's been a, a difficult time for Manchester United, although they they drew with Liverpool, which isn't the worst result ever really in a season. You know, I think it's three games now for Manchester United without a win. You know, I think I saw a statistic the other day that before the Liverpool game uh, in the hundred and eighth minute uh, they were leading two games and they only ended up with one point out of both of them games before the Liverpool one. So as you said, you know, it's, I think that's almost a, a mirror image of the, of the season so far, isn't it? Just when you thought Man United have turned a corner, a big reality check hits. And of course, as we know, inevitably as it happens with not just Manchester United, but pretty much every football club in the world, when the performances and the results aren't going your way, the manager will ultimately be under some criticism. And we've seen that um, probably pretty much since the start of the season, if we're being perfectly honest. There have been at least question marks over Ten Hag's future, whereas now there's, of course, with several names being linked, but with the performances as well, it's inevitable, isn't it? So what can you tell us about Eric Ten Hag? I think it's only right to stay there or start there, should I say. And what are the chances of him being there next season, if you like? Because I think we're, we're almost in agreement that he probably will get to the end of the season right yeah the the Liverpool win effectively gave him at least a stay of execution Liverpool winning the cup three weeks ago yeah um at least got him a stay of execution until the end of the season because that got him the FA Cup semi-final one you'd like to think though you never know when Manchester United did that they'd beat Coventry uh mm. and then book a book a spot in the final uh you wouldn't like to think I wouldn't like to hope it's against City again um but uh, yeah, at least uh, you know an FA Cup final. We know that's not been enough to save managers in the past. Louis van Gaal won the FA Cup, and then a couple of days later, Jose Mourinho was in his in his office. So, like, it's no guarantee of a of a job. But the thing is with um, with Ten Hag, you think he'd actually be under more pressure than he is, because two years into his job, and we we've been through this. I've been through this so many times. But two years into his job, we still don't know what his style of play is. Um, the performances aren't getting better. Um, the, the yes, the results uh, you know, after the after the uh, the cup win against Liverpool, you hoped it would turn a corner, but the performances have got worse. You know, we've all we all know of how many shots United are facing, and with a little bit of luck, uh, other teams would have put United to the sword. Liverpool should have been way out of sight before half time um, at the weekend, uh, and United shouldn't have even been in with a shout. Took two sensational goals, but this is what this team does, isn't it? They've got amazing individual talent, and they can do that, um, but tactically. We're still not seeing enough from Ten Hag, and you would actually think that he'd be under more pressure. But what I did a piece in this last week. What, what the issue is for United is there's just not that many available coaches and interested. That's another key thing: interested coaches out there. And there's also a lot of big clubs looking for a manager. So the, the, these Graham Potter is sat at home, and he's getting phone calls from Man United one day, Liverpool perhaps the next, Barcelona the next. <laughs> Bayern Munich, you know, these are big clubs that are going to be looking for the manager. PSG will be due a new manager soon, I'm sure. Like, these these are going to be big clubs, and there's not that many available uh, and interested uh, uh, avail managers in the world at the moment. Now, with United, the heavy linked, heavily linked with Gareth Southgate and Julian Nag Nagelsmann, uh, and, and the Euros is going to play a, play a big role in whether they would even be interested in the job. So if Germany have an absolute nightmare and get knocked out in the group stage, I know that's very unlikely in this new format, but if they do, then Nagelsmann is, could be available a lot sooner than most anticipate. And if you're available uh, and if you're a free agent, then you, you, know, you want another job quickly, especially if they're available. And United is of interest to Julian Nagelsmann, but if, if Germany do okay, 
and he keep and it stay you know keeps his job, which is more than likely going to happen, whether they win it or they get to the quarterfinal, semi final, and he keeps his job. My understanding is that he's he wants to see his Germany project out. You've got to bear in mind he's not been in the job long, so he'd only be in for one tournament and then he goes off somewhere else. He's very very young. He knows that he can wait around. For, you know, United will come around again, <laughs> perhaps. Um, you know, he, 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 Fergie's don't grow on trees. You know, there aren't managers, there aren't other managers that last 20 years anymore. And, you know, even if the next manager who comes in at United does well, say he does three, four, five years, Nagelsmann can try again in five years. There's absolutely no rush. And it's, it's the same with Gareth Southgate. Now, we know the links about with Southgate and, and Manchester United. It's obvious why he would be linked with United because of Dan Ashworth and their um, their history together. Uh, we know that Ashworth is a big fan of Southgate, and it could work. Uh, I a lot of angry Manchester United fans out there. I really don't want you know, Southgate. I was very very. I did a a piece on on Friday about how, as it stands, Southgate and Nagelsmann are not interested, uh, or not 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 interested. Sorry, are having serious doubts about the Manchester United job because I spoke to somebody in the England setup who works with Southgate, and he said. Why would Southgate leave England now? Even if England do well in the Euro, say, say they win it, right? And why would he leave now when this is potentially, we've said this a lot over the years, but it really it, it probably is the best generation of talent available to an England manager, but certainly in my lifetime anyway. And, you know, you, you're struggling to fit Cole Palmer in the team. Like, mm. that's, that's insane. Like, that's how much quality there is. Like, there's debate whether Phil Foden could start for England. Like, one of the best players to ever come out of the of um of any academy in this country, and you're not sure where you can fit him in the team. That's how much ability that Gareth Southgate's got available to him. Why would he want to leave that to take Manchester United in the current state it's in? Now, what supporters, a lot of supporters aren't realizing, and I, I do get it, is that certain generation of supporters, i.e., my age, which I'm not going to reveal, mm. um, they are, grew up on United winning everything and success became like a given United were going to at least finish you know I remember when United finished third in you know in 2003 or whatever it was and it was a disaster like people were calling for Fergie's head like it was and now look at it you'd, you'd snap your hand off a third like United are not what they used to be and they're not there's a whole generation of supporters of of, 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 of younger supporters who don't remember United winning anything never never mind never mind league after league after league it's been so long since they won major trophies um and managers especially younger managers are not necessarily looking at united and thinking that's the pinnacle of where i want to be now you know in in the late 90s early 2000s you know the united could have got any manager in the world any manager in the world would have wanted to coach this group of players in this stadium with this funding behind them, because they had a lot of money to spend back then. And now, I don't think there's that many managers out there that are going to want the job. And that's that's why I, I think that Ten Hag is not under as much press, uh, pressure as perhaps he should be, considering the state of the squad and the state of um, United this season in the Premier League. Yeah, exactly that. And I think uh, it, it, it ties in nicely, doesn't it? That idea of the fact that Ten Hag doesn't really feel that much pressure at the moment because of the lack of options out there. It, it ties in, as I say, to a lot of Manchester United fans who are open to keeping Eric Ten Hag. And now I'm completely fine, of course, with everyone being entitled to their opinion. As, as Manchester United fans or football fans, we all, as I say, are allowed to have our say, if you like. But if the only reason as to why you'd want Eric Ten Hag to stay is because there's no one else out there or because, you know, may not had always sacked their managers, by that very logic, if I was the Manchester United manager, I would stay another season. And now I absolutely love football, but I don't fancy myself as a football manager. So, you know, I think I need a little bit more to work with, if that makes sense, in terms of of Eric Ten Hag's side. Um, just one quick name as well, before we move on to uh, to board level, shall we say, in, at Manchester United, is Roberto De Zerbi. Now, obviously, he's been strongly linked with Man United. Some reports are saying that he is on this, this supposed list of potential replacements. And other reports are almost saying that, no, this isn't as strong as 
other outlets are sort of making out. He's had a bit of a, a bit of a strange season this year, hasn't he? Compared to obviously last season, the consistency hasn't been there. The performances haven't been quite as strong and they haven't looked as, as impressive as they did last year, of course, when it comes to Brighton. So firstly, are these links or have these links, should I say, got a bit of weight behind them or is it again a bit of paper talk? And in your personal opinion, would Deserby be someone of interest to you? Um, personally, I think he's a fantastic coach, and I did a I did a piece on uh, I did a piece last season with some of his former players in Italy, and whenever you, you you speak to former players of a coach, sometimes they're a bit yeah you know it was it was good, but he did this this and this. These players absolutely loved him. One of them one of them who's playing in the lower leagues in Italy now was like this man you know this man is a god. Like we have pictures of him all over our house. Like you know like he, they. They absolutely they hold him in such high regard. His players. You speak to a lot of Brighton players as well. They speak of him so highly. He's such a good man manager, and players absolutely love him, and he plays fantastic football. I think he'd be a great appointment. United's problem is again what I was talking about earlier. Is I think there's other jobs that he's interested in. Now I don't think he'll go to Liverpool because I think that's pretty much Amarimi's going to get that. Um, Bayern Munich, I think, is the one that really, from what I from what I've been told, is one that really appeals to him. This is if he does leave Brighton. Now there's no guarantee that he's going to. I I from what I've been told, I know United and Ineos are do have him on this on this list. They are interested in him. He is of he is of interest to Manchester United and Ineos if Ten Hag goes. Um I just it's the it's again, it's the persuasion. Persuasion of of to leave a to leave a, a good job at Brighton with a fantastic chairman, one of the best, um, a, a fantastic owner, one of the best in the ra- around, to join United in this chaotic state that they're in now. Um, if it was me, I wouldn't. I wouldn't absolutely not. I wouldn't. If if I had other options, if Bayern Music was another option, I think I'd go for that. And that's what I think he's going to do. So again, it, it's whether he whether he'd want the job. He is of interest, but he's not. There are there are others above him in the list. But this shortlist is going to have to be quite long, I think, because I don't I don't know if the top players in this in this list are going to want the job. Yeah, short list should be called long list when it comes to the replacements <laughs> of Man United. But uh, yeah, it's again something that's going to be rambling on. I think, look, whether Manchester United fans like it or not, I do, I do sense that there's going to be a, a new manager at Manchester United, as you alluded to brilliantly earlier. You know, Lou Van Howe win the FA Cup. It was a nice moment for him, but ultimately it didn't really save anything in terms of him rem- keeping uh, his job at Old Trafford. So, yeah, I think I think it's going to be almost inevitable. A new ownership comes in. They w- they have their own ideas. They have a new project and they and they want to see it unfold. We've seen it at the likes of Chelsea and, and Bournemouth as well. You know, despite what the manager does, you know, it almost is slightly irrelevant because, as I say, you know, people have their different visions and their different paths that they want to go down. So, yeah, it will certainly be one to look out for. Um, but let's move on now slightly to obviously the, the, the board level, the the hierarchy at Manchester United. Of course, Jason Wilcox from Southampton is a name that has been linked with Man United for quite a while, to be honest. I think even before we had our first chat on MUFC MPB, it was a name that was being floated around. But I think since then, there has been sort of formal reporting, shall we call it, if if you can ever call things like that, uh, such things. But is this sort of, you know, being any closer to a compensation fee being sorted with with Southampton? Because I know it's my understanding, I think it's common knowledge now that Southampton weren't exactly overjoyed with Man United's mm-hmm. approach, shall we say. So take it away. What can we sort of gather from Jason Wilcox and what's the latest there? The hope is, that, and it is only a hope at this stage, is that both Wilcox and Ashworth will be in by the summer. Wilcox much more likely to be in the summer with, uh, in place by the summer than Ashworth, that's for sure. Um, because Newcastle are just not budging on that. But with 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 Wilcox, it's such a I mean, Ineos didn't realise it was going to be this. I don't think it was going to be this difficult because the the and when you're trying to persuade Wilcox to come to United, that's no issue. Now, this is very different to the managerial search because if you're now gonna get given the keys to Old Trafford, i.e. Ash like Ashworth and Wilcox are and Effectively, a blank, um, a blank, uh, blank sheet of paper, and say, "You sign who you want. We need a rebuild. We're going to clear out all these players, and you start again, clear the decks at one of the biggest clubs in the world. That's a great job. So they've had no problem persuading Wilcox to come back to Manchester, even though he's only been in Southampton a season. Um, and the same with Ashworth um, to work at, you know, to work under Ineos and work at Manchester United. You can't say no to that. Um, and but with Wilcox. It, it, it's such a strange, it's such a strange negotiation because United are adamant 
that this there's a release clause in in Wilcox's contract, and they believe this release clause is if you if they pay up um, a year's salary as compensation as as a level of compensation, then that releases him for the contract. And Southampton are denying that this exists within the contract. Now I'm not financially savvy enough to to understand whether. Surely, if, to me, surely it's in black and white, isn't it? On a isn't a contract just a piece of paper? Isn't there a doesn't it say in that if it meets this, then he can be released from his contract? I don't understand why there's a discrepancy. I don't understand why there's a disagreement between the clubs, and that is it's obviously so. Southampton, are, as you said, as you said, are angry about how Manchester United did it in terms of the timing. You know, it's a crucial time of the season. The Championship's crazier than the Premier League um, in terms of getting promotion. Um, did the United need to act now? But the United are saying they've not done anything wrong. So there's such a, this the, the 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 two the poles apart at the moment in terms of in terms of how they're feeling that they've acted, and Southampton are just doing every everything they can to make it difficult essentially, which is what Newcastle are doing, and that is that is really delaying Ineos in their in their tracks, and um, it looked like United were going to have some sort of real you know football and structuring which has been long overdue as we know um by the summer and and it was looking really promising you know Ineos have made three great appointments more than three more than the Glazers have done in uh, you know a 19 years or however long it is and now it looks like potentially on, only Omar Barada is going to be in by the summer now I'm not making any accusations here, but I mean, I don't think we can really believe that United aren't on the phone to Ashworth and Wilcox every day um, discussing future moves. Now, they will say they're not, of course, but I, I don't think he's going to walk in. I don't think Wilcox is going to walk in, say he walks in in the summer, having never spoken about anything to do with the club for next season. I think we all know things are going on behind the doors, but you can't officially um, make any decisions now. And this also ties into the managerial thing as well, because Radcliffe and and Brailsford are adamant they don't want to be the ones making the, the decision on the manager. What one of the I've, I spoke to a few people who have worked with Dave Brailsford for years, and they said his best one of his best attributes is that he gets the right people in, and he knows when to when when to delegate responsibility to others. Now and and use others' expertise because he's not the, he's not got expertise in football management. He doesn't know what what makes a football manager, and he's fine to admit that. Some people, not naming any names, Ed Woodward wouldn't do that, and he was more he was more than willing to take decisions that he shouldn't been taking. And that was that's been one of the biggest problems in Manchester United for the for the last decade. People in the wrong positions making the wrong decisions. Now, what why that why um, Ratcliffe and and Brailsford are so keen to get Ashworth and Wilcox and Barada in is they want them to make the decisions because they're the ones who know what they're doing and they don't want United to repeat the same mistakes as they've been doing for the 10 years. So that's why I think it's a very strong possibility that Eric Ten Hag will be in place by the, uh, will still be in place by the summer. And it, even if they're not there, even if Wilcox and, and Ashworth are not there, Barada is more than capable of, 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 of making decisions himself. But in terms of Wilcox coming in, at the moment we just don't know. At the moment we don't know. It's a matter of when he's he's going to come. He's going to come. He's very interested. It's just like Ashworth. It's a very frustrating process. It's just I can imagine. It's just the same conversations every day. Like, have you changed your mind yet? Are you willing to? Are you willing to release him from gardening leave and what have you? I don't imagine what the what the negotiations can be because both all parties know what is going to happen. It's just a matter of when and how awkward Newcastle and Southampton want to make it for Manchester United. Yeah, I, I never thought I'd be in a world where Manchester City, out of the three central clubs Man United are in discussion with, have been the most understanding and sort of uh, <laughs> just honest with the way that they're doing things. It's, it's a crazy world that we live in, but there we go, there we have it. I think if anything's going to summarise what's going on Man United, it's the fact that Man City have actually been the only team that have helped Man United so far <laughs> in this process. So I think if, yeah. if that doesn't explain it, no, nothing will. So yeah, it's it's again, it's it's... It's a little bit frustrating, isn't it? Of course, you know, as we we all know, we want the answers and whether or not Ineos will be the the party or the team that will lead Man United back to the glory days of yesterday, it remains to be seen, of course. But we at least want them in just so they can have a chance at doing so, you know? So it's going to be, again, something that we have to keep our eye on and hopefully anyway, sooner rather than later, we'll get a significant update in regards to both of them individuals. 
just before we move on from Ineos, I just wanted to ask you quickly, are there any sort of like further appointments that they're looking to make? Is it a, a, a situation really where they're looking at Barada, Wilcox and Ashworth? They've seen them three individuals. They've identified them nice and early. Are they the three individuals that they're looking for? And them only three, them only as the three individuals that they want to bring in, or is there any other potential names potentially you've heard, or or any positions that may not would maybe look to fill? There's 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 more job title, titles than I knew existed when when, <laughs> when it comes to Ineos's plans for, for Manchester United, and I assumed that Jason Wilcox was coming in as head of recruitment, uh, and he was going to answer to Ashworth, but no, he's going to work alongside Ashworth as a kind of technical director. Um, and they still want to bring in a head of recruitment. This is well, this is what I mean about um, Ineos. They really want to get the structure in place before any other decisions are made. You know, it, it, it's literally they're, they're literally starting at the top and working their way down. Um, and that's the, that's what they think United should have been doing for ten years, and, and they're probably right. Um, now they still want a head of recruitment. Uh, we've seen the names linked. Um, my understanding is that Paul Mitchell doesn't uh, want the job. Um, he was earmarked and was in the running to be sporting director until uh, Brailsford swooped for his number one choice in, in Ashworth. And my understanding is, even though that Paul Mitchell has, has recently moved back to Manchester after, after he left Monaco last year, um, my understanding is that he wants a bigger job than a head of recruitment. He essentially wants to be a sporting director. And there's plenty of opportunities around Europe. It's not that, you know, he's not confined to to England um, he's been heavily linked with Roma um, and Newcastle is an option as well I've seen I've somebody somebody told me that um, Newcastle uh, he's on Newcastle's list as well potentially um, but my understanding is the front runner for that would be Julian Ward um, and I think one of the main appeals is that He's available and there's no negotiation. There's no such thing as gardening leave. His garden's immaculate. So <laughs> he can cut, he can come in and he can start right away. And I think uh, with Ashworth and Wilcox, yes, Ineos have said, right, we want these and we are willing to wait. And I get that. They want the, they want the right people in and, they, and they've accepted that fixing United isn't going to happen overnight, which I think is the right way of doing things. But there are certain, they, they still need somebody in there. They still need somebody in there quite quick, somebody who they know that they can get in quickly and they can start on Monday. And I think that Julian Ward is that is that man for them. Dougie Friedman is another is another name. Um, I've seen mentioned. I don't know myself whether that's going to happen or not. Um, people I've spoken to don't know about that. Um, but I think Julian Ward, uh, head of recruitment, could be could be in and could be in quite soon. Although. Um, it depends how exhausted Manchester United and Ineos are by the, uh, by the uh, trying to persuade Ashworth and, and Wilcox to come in now. Yeah, I think you should know by now, as we all as we all should, that Manchester United and soon should never ever be in the same sentence. There's there's nothing soon yeah. or quick about anything related to yeah. Manchester United. I just want to, I know we've run out of time and I do want to sort of cover all bases because I know that a lot of the MUFC MPB community really, really enjoy when you come on this channel. So yeah, I just want to sort of take your your interest and your focus now onto sort of the player side of things. You know, Saudi Arabia have um, have made it clear again in the in the recent days and weeks that they will try any way to, to make some big, big signings. They've made a list, it's my understanding, of, of several players that they want, um, which includes the likes of Casemiro and Rafa Varane. I just wanted to touch base with both of these players. You know, I, I, I think I'm not sure if it was yourself or someone else that was telling me on this very channel that the, the midfield area will only be addressed once Man United sort of know what's going to happen with Casemiro in terms of signing a new player in that position. So firstly, we'll, we'll start with Casemiro before we move on to Varane. Is he expected to leave this summer as many reports and outlets are suggesting? Or could there be a potential, as with Varane, that some some conversations, new talks from Man United's perspective could be taking place to see where both players are at? Or, or are these quite set in stone? I think, from what I can gather, both will go in the summer. Now, Casemiro is... When, when Radcliffe and Brailsford uh, first met with United at Old Trafford in last March, I think it was, um, they... You know they didn't really hold back in telling United where they think they've gone wrong in the transfer market, and they used Casemiro as an example of 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 a, of a inappropriate signing, a player who'd won it all, struggling to you know how do you motivate a player 
who, who's won everything, um, who's on top wages and paid over the odds for a 30-year-old. It was a very good short-term fix. I did a piece on this the other day, a very good short-term fix. And it looked like, finally, after years of trying, United had somebody as capable as Roy, as, as Roy Keane in the heart of midfield, in, in that defensive midfield role. But it was never going to last long term. Didn't have the legs, didn't have the fitness, didn't have the desire. And I don't blame him. Like you, you, you come, you come to Manchester United, and this Manchester United is not what they're putting in the brochure, by the way. Like they're putting in all the all the trophies of the past. They're not putting in this mess that they're in now. So, you know, why would he want to? You know, why would he want to go up a hard slogging every week for very little results under a manager that we still don't know what style of play he's got? So I actually don't blame him. And I wouldn't want I wouldn't want to stick around if I were them. Um, I'd want the easy payday myself. Uh, you know whether you can morally justify that. That's up to them. Um, I think both Casemiro and Varane uh, will go because another thing that Ineos want to do is they want to cut costs. And those two are two of the biggest earners. Varane hardly ever plays. You pay you paying. It was always a risk signing Varane anyway, and it's a risk that's not paid off. He's a he's a wonderful defender when he's fully fit. But what that fully fit? What's that? 10, 15 games a season. It's a real shame, both of them really. United perhaps should have signed them two years, two years previous, and then we might have seen the best from them. We've 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 got the we've got the latter end of 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 their careers, and it's not it's not worked out. My understanding is that both will go and they will start a bit of a fire sale because um, we know that with financial fair play now you can't go around spending hundreds and hundreds of millions that you don't have. United have got to, and then Ineos have also got to find two billion for a new stadium from somewhere. Um, you know, there's only so, so far public money will go. Um, so they've got to, um, yes, yeah, so they've got to bring in money if they want to start spending it. And I think those two, even if even if they don't get much money from, even if they don't, even if they go for free, well, well, Varane will will go. Well, I think will go for free because I don't think he will sign a new deal. If he do, United are willing to offer him a new deal, my understanding, but on much less terms. So why would why would he do that? Why would you take a, a massive pay cut um, when you've got other options? And I think that both of them will go and their, their savings on wage, wages alone will be big for financial fair play. So I think they'll be two of the first out the door. Yeah, yeah. And it's a, it's, a, it's a perfect phrase that you put there almost, isn't it? With the with the fire sale, I think there'll be several players uh, at Manchester United that will at least at the very minimum be on a on a list. Again, another list for Man United. There's all sorts of lists <laughs> flying around, isn't there? But I think, yeah, they, they are two players and two individuals that I've heard very, very often and for quite a while now, really, isn't it? As you said, you know, since yeah. Sir Jim Ratcliffe's comments about them in inverted commas, silly signings of, you know, he basically said Casemiro without actually saying Casemiro. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think, um, like you said, I, I'm, I'm in perfect agreement there. I think they'll be two amongst two of the players that will be leaving Manchester United in the summer. I think what you just said there about, you know, the the, the FFP stuff and the budget will be a, a very big factor, not just for Man United, of course, I think for, for every club, isn't it, that look at Everton, it's almost like they get a decent result and bang, FFP just takes them right back into the into the relegation fight. So, you know, it's it's going to be something that's really, really going to be prominent and, and at the forefront of every club's sort of manoeuvres and, and decision-making throughout the summer and, and beyond. But in terms of Man United, of course, as we say, you know, we are expecting that Manchester United will sell a lot of players, will try and raise funds, not only through transfer fees, but also, as you alluded to a little bit ago, with the wage side of things, I think most Man United players are on astronomical fees. So pretty much most of the signings will save a lot of money on that front. But how many players do you think will come in through the door? As we know, as I've just said before, you know, the midfield will be dependent on if Casemiro leaves, which is probably likely. There'll be a s several departures in the centre half position. We already know Man United are very desperate for a left back, a striker to accompany Hoyland. There's so much that needs to happen at Man United. But how many players do you think they will be looking to sign in a realistic window in the summer? I think um, I'm not just sitting on the fence here. I think it depends how many they, how many they ship out because if they if they struggle to offload players like they did last summer, you know. Um, Scott McTominay looked like he was going to go for so long, didn't go. Harry Maguire looked like he was going to go, didn't go. Um, they they need to ship out before they can start spending big. Um, and it all depends how many they get rid of. You know, is Mason Greenwood going to go? Um, there's so much more to happen in that. Um, so I th there are certain areas that they that it, it's no secret that they need. They, the United need center, a centre-half, at least one. Uh, United need a left-back. That is absolutely clear. Um even if even if they they keep the other two, I mean, they're never, neither of them are ever fit. Um, so United need a left back, and they need at least one more forward. 
Um, I think they're, they're the priority areas rather than the midfield. But again, like you say, if Casemiro goes, then they're going to have they're going to have to fill the hole. You know, there's not enough players. There's not enough personnel. I personally think McTominay will go this summer, and the money they raise for him can go on a can go on a midfielder as well. Um, there's got it's going to be it's going to be a, a don't expect you know big name marquee signings. I, Ratcliffe said that, but I you know sometimes they say things they don't necessarily mean. But Ineos really do want United to learn the lessons of the last ten years and look at all the big names, the Di Marias, the Lukaku's that didn't fit. United signed the player and not um so, sorry signed the name and not the right player. And it and United need to learn those lessons. That's what. Brailsford is really, really keen on. So if United have do have a bit of a fire sale, expect five, six, seven perhaps new arrivals. But I think it will be the same level, if not more, people going out. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I'm, I'm inclined to agree there. It is very dependent. And ultimately, Man United are almost in, in a very difficult place in terms of trying to decide and dictate what they want to do. Because as you were saying a little bit ago, and as many people are saying that Ineos want to build from the top down and ultimately they need to get these certain individuals, as we've spoke about on today's podcast, in through the door immediately. Just one final yeah. question there. You, you mentioned him very briefly just a second ago in terms of Mason Greenwood. There's a lot of eyes and there's a lot of thoughts going towards Mason Greenwood. I think for a couple of reasons, really, you know, on paper and uh, on a football inside of things, Man United need a forward. He's almost like a perfect forward for, to come into Manchester United. He's English, he's young, he's versatile. He obviously has got the ability and all the capability into the world. But as we know, the off the field sort of um, politics, if we can call it that, have, uh, have almost cast a dark cloud and a real uncertainty in what's going to happen in his future, never mind just with Manchester United. So mm. what can we sort of think about in terms of Greenwood at this stage you know I think it was almost put to bed wasn't it but then Sir Jim Ratcliffe slightly opened the door at the very minimum to at least a second sort of review if you like of Mason Greenwood's future so we'll end it with this this question here you know what what's the latest with Mason Greenwood have any of us made a decision on on Greenwood and in your personal opinion what do you think will happen with Greenwood I know that's probably about five questions in one but I just thought <laughs> I'd throw them all in there quickly for you Peter <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I'll try and answer them all individually <laughs> if I can. But uh, I think I think with um, with Mason Greenwood, um, it's such a difficult situation that that Sir Jim Radcliffe didn't need to bring up again. Like he didn't need he didn't need to bring it into the public sphere again. Um, it's he, he could have easily said, we'll, um, "We'll keep that behind closed doors." When he was asked about it, we'll keep that behind closed doors. Uh, I don't know enough about it, what have you, and blah, blah, blah. But, I mean, to say that United are, are going to look at it again in terms of an investigation, he's got enough to do. They've got enough to do. And I don't think, um, I just, I, I don't think it's something that Ineos need to be revisiting. My understanding is um, that as it stands now, and it, it changes in the Greenwood situation quite a lot, um, is that United's preference is still to sell, sell Mason Greenwood in the summer. Um we know with financial fair play whether this is right or wrong is 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 another conversation. But with financial fair play, it's it goes on the balance sheet as a hundred percent profit if you sell a if you sell an academy graduate, and if they can get forty million for for Mason Greenwood, that's huge for their you know hope to reinvest into the squad, um, and the revamp of the squad in the summer. And my understanding is that Atletico Madrid is still very interested. Barcelona have been, but I think less so, um, because you know we don't know who's going to be manager there next season. Um, so whether they, you know, the new manager will want uh, a a furore like like Greenwood could potentially cause um, is another issue. So Atletico Madrid are interested. Juventus are are, are, are a, a new team that I've been told are, uh, are keeping their eye on on Mason Greenwood. It's it's clear that. He's too good for Getafe at, at, at that at that level, so he could go to any number of, of of European leagues. My personal opinion is I don't think he can have a a future at Manchester United and even in England. Um, we you know we all we all we all know what's gone on there. Um, opposition opposition supporters won't let um, Mason Greenwood forget something like that, um, and I just think. It, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a new storm that clubs in England will not want. Um, so I think that I think he I think he will go. I think he will go in the summer. Um, I think United will sell, and I think 
a top European club, a Juventus, a, a, a Atletico Madrid, somebody like that, uh, are, are the most likely destination. And, and and then everyone can move on. My I'd, my understanding is from conversations that I've had is that Greenwood isn't isn't uh, like that bothered about coming back to England. He's not. He's not. He doesn't believe that he can, you know, restart again at Manchester United, um, and he'd very much be open to moving to another European league and and carrying on like he like he like he has been doing this season. And um, I I think there'll be more interested parties as we go towards the end of the season. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm I'm right on your page there when it comes to Greenwood. It's it's an aspect that we have to almost understand and realise what why there's such a media circus around this situation, but then also from a footballing aspect, you know, it could be a very viable option for Manchester to raise funds and ultimately sell someone who's not actually even in the fold. So it, it, it yeah. does make a lot of sense, doesn't it, to move him on. But unfortunately, Peter, that's all we've got time for today. Thank you so mm -hmm. much for joining me. It really is such a pleasure as always. I'm not just saying this because we're, we're still recording now, but it is genuinely such a pleasure to talk to someone like yourself. I think I've said on this very podcast and this very YouTube channel alone that, you know, on MUFC MPB, it's not about getting people on that are going to just answer every single question and say, I know this, I know that. They stick to what they know. And I'm just very grateful and thankful that you do know quite a lot. So thank you so <laughs> much for joining me. And I'm very, very sure that we will be joined again on this very channel to talk things all Manchester United. Thank you, mate. No problem. And thank you, of course, to everyone who has watched today's episode on the MUFC MPB channel. You know what time it is. It's all about liking, subscribing, following on Twitter or X or however you call it. Make sure you drop Peter a follow as well. He's right across everything with Manchester United. And please be sure to come back and watch another one of our videos because I will be joined by another brilliant guest in the short future. Thank you, everyone, and have a brilliant day.